the access that it gets us to important stakeholders that we would not have had an access to before i think that in and of itself has been so huge and transformational for us as a startup you know the these are some of the top people in the world that you can connect with to try and identify people who get the paradigm shift and who've placed that at the heart of their strategy whether as a business or a foundation but really place that into their strategy and not as a peripheral thing i think that's really where the value is for people like us at desolinator i think the uh, uplink connection has been huge for us because um, we always have international ambitions we are always hoping to get gain kind of some communicate connections with uh, world health organization and get introduced to different healthcare systems and I, i think like uplink has done a great job with accelerating that process being part of this cohort has been uh been absolutely amazing in making sure that we are in touch with the right people again at the right time and ensure that our technologies and and services are able to not only help uh with covid-19 but in any way that we can impact the overall scientific and medical community I really think that Uplink has the opportunity to to do a tremendous amount in connecting uh in supporting entrepreneurs uh who really are the vanguards the the entrepreneurs the ones who are out there pushing for change and and reimagining our world Good morning and good evening everyone it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to our session on restoring cross border mobility Over the last year the COVID-19 pandemic has all but decimated the aviation travel and tourism sector wreaking havoc on economies international mobility and the movement of people and essential goods Seafarers are stranded thousands of planes are grounded and millions of jobs and dollars have been lost but science and technology and global cooperation has offered us a light at the end of this dark tunnel and the World Economic Forum is dedicated to using its platform to restore international mobility in a manner that is safe clean and inclusive. The last few years we've worked on addressing travel and border security by harnessing technologies such as digital identity, distributed ledgers and biometrics to keep travelers and destinations safe. We've also worked very closely with the health sector on protocols for pandemic preparedness. However, 2020 has further reinforced the need for these sectors and others like global supply chain and transportation to work together. The Common Trust Network is the forum's platform for stakeholders in tech, health, and mobility to address the challenge of trust in health data and credentials for the purpose of travel and commerce. The network brings together multiple governments with providers and users of digital wallets and health passes to establish common standards, protocols, and registries for the trusted sharing of test or vaccination records, putting the individual at the center and empowering them with access to their most important health information. This is first and foremost a health challenge which has drastic impact on aviation, tourism, shipping and supply chains and I implore all relevant stakeholders to join us as we tackle this shared challenge to create a global public good. I'm pleased to hand over to our moderator for this session, Kia Simmons, senior international correspondent from NBC News, who will lead our discussion with our esteemed panelists. Over to you, Kia. Hey Lauren, thank you very much Lauren Upping there, head of aviation travel and tourism for the World Economic Forum. And what a year in tech and in health and in travel. Uh, an extraordinary year, a challenging year. We have a great panel to talk about all of the issues that is raised and the and the positives that we've seen. We have Dr. Harsh Vardhan, the Union Minister for Health and Family Welfare, Science and Technology and Earth Science of India and chairman of the executive board of the World Health Organization. We have David Sin, co-founder, group president and deputy chairman of Fullerton Health, Robin Toombs, <clears throat> CEO and co-founder Yoti, which as you know, stands for your own trusted identity, and Sabrina Chow, president delegate at Bimco. A, a, a stunning year and a, a year in which uh, big tech uh, has 
taken off. Uh, people have had to uh, find new solutions. And also a year where we've seen nationalism and protectionism, a, ca a countervailing force, if you like. Uh, just to give one example, just think about the uh, split screen of this. I in Europe, right this week, you have this unedifying image picture of governments squabbling over who should get vaccines first. Whereas in India, you've just seen India airlift 5 million vaccines to the Indian Ocean region, to Myanmar, Bangladesh, Mauritius, Seychelles. And India is doing that right at the moment where it is just beginning to uh, try to vaccinate its own more than a billion people. Uh, and of course, that Indian solution is the right solution when it comes to vaccines, because we know that unless you vaccinate the whole world, uh, you don't tackle uh, the coronavirus. But what that just illustrates is how we are battling in the world with these two countervailing forces, uh, what we need to do versus the panic and the fears and the concerns of uh, uh, populations and, and countries. So if I can start with you, uh, Dr. Vardan, um, could you just give us the picture of it. You're clearly uh, somebody who likes hard work. While you are uh, a minister in India, you also, during the pandemic, uh, took the chairmanship of the Executive Board of the World Health Organization. Uh, can I start with you with the question, what, have you, what are the positives and what are the negatives that you've seen in, in, in the past year? And what, what do you see as the challenges uh, and the hopeful signs uh, looking forward? I think if uh, I could uh, correctly follow what you asked me was that what is the greatest challenge right now for uh, like uh, restoring this uh, cross-border movement of people and uh, various goods and of course uh, other things. Uh, you see the COVID-19 pandemic, it has uh, gravely wounded the world economy with serious consequences impacting all the communities all across the world and individuals. It has also hit supply chains and it has therefore impacted trade and development in a major way. Moving rapidly across borders along the principal arteries of the global economy, the spread of the virus has benefited from the underlying interconnectedness of globalization. And we may have lost you there, Dr. Radhan. Ah, you're back. Please continue. In the context of public health, I would, since I, I look after health and science and technology, I will be focusing more on the public health side of it. The, and I would say that in the context of public health, clear, transparent, and timely sharing of crucial information on public health emergencies by undertaking rapid risk assessment and disseminating the risk this is the key to striking a balance between public health and trade and also travel. Conducting such risk assessments would entail rapid analysis of causative agents, their origin and transmission dynamics, geographic spread, the pathogenicity of the disease, the population and age groups which are affected, the associated fatality, the potential impact on health, livelihood, and also the economy. Additionally, it is imperative to have standard operating procedures to streamline operations of international contact tracing also. In the context of COVID-19 detection of mutant variants in some of the countries, which has led to resurgence in cases this has emerged as another impediment in dialing down the existing travel and trade restrictions that countries have put up in a bid to restrict the spread of COVID-19. So 
although we have to ultimately develop the mechanisms from where we were one year back i think a lot of things have improved further but certainly we have to act with uh, a lot of uh, patience also and with a lot of uh, uh, meticulous precision and vision and take care of the uh, whole issue in a very very uh, i would say uh, dedicated sincere committed and scientific manner Okay, Dr. Vardhan, uh, that's a great um, kind of set up, sets up for us, if you like. David Sin, uh, uh, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I, I think you have 12,000 medical providers around the world uh, in, in nine countries. So that's quite a logistical challenge. What have been your breakthroughs and your frustrations? Uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, good day to everyone. I, I think being the Apex largest managed care organization, currently with about 13 million uh, patients across the markets you mentioned. Uh, we have been, and we've been blessed uh, to partner with governments across the region. Uh, we have also been working uh, to enter into multiple PPPs with the public health system. And I think uh, if I may just pick up the point, uh, some of the challenges we've faced, uh, as Minister Hadan had said, is really an efficient and timely sharing of information uh, not just within the public health system, but really between the public and the private health systems as well. Uh, we have been an integral partner to governments and health systems, uh, especially in COVID. Uh, our own experience in Singapore, um, being one of the first few countries to implement large-scale uh, COVID-19 vaccination uh, programs across the country, uh, we today run 50% of the country's uh, vaccination centers uh, in partnership with the Ministry of Health here in Singapore. I think we face uh, multiple challenges. Um, I think one, one blessing we've had is the relationship between the public and the private health systems uh, in Singapore are relatively good, uh, which means information, ramping up logistics, uh, and earlier to our point, mobilization of resources, especially uh, health workers that are either trapped in Singapore that can't go back to their home countries or even Singaporeans uh, have been a, a relative challenge. From our perspective, uh, as we serve close to 4,000 patients a day across our facilities in vaccinations, we run into all sorts of challenges from scheduling patients uh, to applying and administering the, vaccin the vaccines uh, to ensuring that patients and um, would-be customers would stay on for observations. I think it's also been important for us to highlight that uh, prior to vaccination, and this is really important because you also want to be in a position to effectively test, screen for, on a large scale basis for COVID-19 across the region, not just uh, in one country, but across borders. And the, um, the policing or rather the auditing of such testing and screening capabilities across uh, the 10 countries that we're present in um, do present uh, quite a bit of uh, SOP and protocol challenges. Uh, I think the last point I would say uh, and this is really not so much a call to action, but really our own experience, is really the more private institutions and private organizations uh, look towards entering into PPPs with the public systems, be it the health, the travel, the, uh, the economic uh, ministries, the better it is uh, for all of us across the world. That's your cue, uh, Robin Toombs. <laughs> uh, I have to ask you one question, which is what is that kind of cell phone uh, to the left of your shoulder? And then, of course, just pick up from where David left off there, because what you're trying to do is to uh, create integrated tech that can enable people to uh, travel more easily, both in terms of work and in terms of uh, vacation holidays. Yeah, hi, hi Kia. I think, you know, the, the biggest challenge um, for us as a business has been, you know, we, we were able to do a lot of things online. And, you know, this is an ex a very good example of that using video conferencing. We can actually do a lot of work quite quickly with lots of people who otherwise we might have had to wait to book meetings and go and, you know, uh, see them. And sometimes actually that slows people down. But in other areas, it's really, really difficult. So, you know, we've been working a lot with biotechnology and health labs and, and actually not being able to go and see those people to work on the machines to understand how how we need to interact with those machines. It, it really, you really need to be able to go and see 
people and work with them in in the lab or in their offices to do that and that that's been a real challenge and we've seen how a lot of those biotech companies they, they need to be able to move their their wet mixes from poland to the us and you know at the moment that's really difficult you know there aren't as many planes flying the planes may not go direct um, you've got to keep that really cold so there's a huge amount of challenges because the travel sector is effectively at the moment not not kind of open open skies as per normal. And I think probably the biggest challenge, but also hopefully the biggest opportunity is to kind of restore trust in that kind of sector where people can across countries and across sectors and across relying parties actually be confident that somebody in the maritime sector has been tested, that might be on board ship, or it might be at the last port, but you need a really efficient way for all employees and all people, including passengers, to be able to prove who they are, prove that they've got the right credentials to do X or Y. And without that, I think the world's found it actually very difficult this year to, to kind of scale up some of the testing, some of the ways of then relying on that. And, you know, clearly, if you if you want to go to Gdansk for a day, but you've got to, you know, go into vaccination, sorry, you've got to go into uh, lockdown for 10 days, uh, quarantine, you, you don't go. So, you, you know, there's a huge amount of challenge there. We, we need a system which is interoperable and allows lots and lots of businesses to trust the relying kind of information credentials from other, other businesses and from other individuals. That's so interesting. Even in the tech world, face-to-face uh, -face is valuable. Sabina Chow, uh, you know all about uh, these challenges of just moving people around. Uh, how tough has it been and, and where have you had successes despite that? Um, thank you, Kia, and uh, thank you for putting me last, because I, I think, you know, it, it, it actually makes a lot of sense that we hear from the government, the health sector, the tech sector, and I can present you a problem that requires everybody's help to, to, to resolve this, and that comes into the maritime sector. Um, I think overall, you know, in, in line with this topic, restoring cross-border mobility, that in terms of the, 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 um, the transportation of goods, that pretty much has, throughout the pandemic, been efficient, you know, that we managed to deliver goods to where they need to go. But the cost of that would be the people that makes that happen, which are our seafarers. And globally, we have 1.7 million seafarers worldwide. And depending on what statistics you read, there are currently between 300,000 to 500,000 seafarers stuck at sea, unable to go home. And it is exactly because there's this breakdown of trust between governments and between borders that don't allow you know our seafarers that you know provide all these goods and services to 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 all the countries and all the people that we use at our home um, that they're not allowed to get home because there's this breakdown of trust. And if you think about the complexity of the issue, you know, you know, Robin talks about, you know, the, the, the infrastructure that needs for it to happen. You need the frontline health worker to administer all these test kits and vaccinations. So it is a huge, huge problem. And you're at, at the complexity of a ship with a crew, let's say an Indian crew that goes from China to Brazil and and, and the contract is up and they need to get home. And then number one, there's no flight to get them from Brazil back to, back to India. And number two, they probably need visa for them to be able to get off the ship. And number three, they need to have a valid um, test kit to show that they are COVID negative. So you can see the complexity of that issue um, that nobody wants to deal with because yes, you know, there is 1.7 million seafarers that basically transport around 10 billion um, tons of goods in, in 20, 20, 2020 last year. Um, so if you think about the efficiency of it, it's actually very high. But in terms of the sheer number of people, it's actually a very small percentage. So it's very hard to get all the governments and get all the organizations together to deal with such a complex issue that we are presented with. And am I right in saying, is it 400,000 seafarers are stranded? right now because countries don't want to let them in because they're from a different country? That's right. I mean, depending on statistics, there are, according to the ILO, um, the International Labour Organization, that number is 300,000 uh, in September. And then there are articles that goes from 300,000, 400,000 to 500,000. So I would just take the average 
400,000, roughly there. <laughs> but still, you know, it's a staggering percentage of, of all the seafarers in the world. That represents like over 15%. Uh, Minister, uh, India is a tech leader, and uh, you uh, have uh, shown uh, a lot of tech savvy in your uh, testing and vaccination programs. How do we solve, though, the kind of problem that Sabrina is talking about uh, with you, with India, a billion people? How do you get them all integrated? And then how do you solve the challenges of cross-border uh, mobility? Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would like to offer my uh, comments of, uh, uh, on the situation existing right now, where we stand, whether it is in India or uh, anywhere else in the world. Uh, though the International Air Transport Association and a few countries in Europe are they already pondering on the idea of a COVID-19 vaccination-based uh, immunity passports uh, or a travel uh, pass in a bit to ease travel restrictions. I personally feel, uh, uh, and I, I, I would say that all the uh, medical professionals and scientists will also have the same feeling that it is a bit too early to talk about the same. Though clinical trials have already suggested that the vaccines are effective at preventing one from getting seriously ill, there are still, you see, critical unknowns such as uh, we really don't know whether the about the efficacy of the vaccination in reducing transmission, also the duration of immunity after uh, vaccination, and also the efficacy of the vaccine against the emerging variants of uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, etc. So just, to be, so just to be clear, Minister, so you, you think it's really too early to talk about vaccine passports as they're known? Uh, you see, I think uh, in view of the above that I mentioned just now, uh, we are of the view that we may uh, have to wait for some more time for evidence to emerge to take further decision on this matter. Further, how, how soon do you think that would be? How, how quickly do you think we could get to a point where there's an integrated system? I, um, I think, you see, uh, uh, further as regards your question on the, uh, the standardization of these implementation frameworks and all, uh, whether for sharing of crucial information on, on public health issues, I must say that uh, it is uh, the international contact tracing or immunity passports that shall ultimately hold the key to ensure their international acceptability. Such frameworks should be used on sound principles of equity and privacy. And uh, I personally feel uh, right now uh, being uh, 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 the director of the uh, 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 executive board of uh, uh, WHO, that WHO as a UN body uh, uh, can play a lead role in achieving a global consensus on such frameworks. And then I would say that uh, developing such cross-border mobility experiences will require uh, cooperation between the health sector as well as aviation, travel, and tourism sector stakeholders. It, Still, and is, is, one of, is, one of, Minister, is, is one of the issues for you in your uh, dealing with, as we know, more than a billion people, is one of the issues for you ensuring you have the trust of your people uh, you see, uh, we have enjoyed the trust of uh, 1.35 billion people in a big way and uh, under the leadership of our Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji, you see, the whole country uh, and it, uh, the whole society stood like a rock behind him yeah. and uh, uh, every appeal that was made. So uh, the whole country has a lot of confidence in what the government does because uh, we have involved everybody. It has been a total government, total society and uh, everyone in the society, all stakeholders, whether the industry, corporate sector, scientists, professionals, everybody has been on board. Yeah. So um, that, that, I, I... Go on, finish, finish up. Please. But, so uh, 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 I feel that uh, such a ch such changes will certainly require a coordinated, harmonized approach, and it has to be a, uh, it has to be a, a global scale uh, as the uh, pandemic itself. 
definitely, I think that timing is of the uh, uh, essence to prevent further harm to economies yeah. and make travelers comfortable with travel. Understood. And of course, from the scientist, uh, scientific side, I would say that the recognizing that scientific consensus around testing and immunization is not yet mature enough and that global guidance around testing has yet to be developed. There is a need to design a flexible model that can help us move past the current fragmentation and that can evolve and ad adapt as the science matures. Some really and important I, points there. Some really important points there. David Sin, um, trust. Uh, are we really, are we really going to have vaccines we can trust? Will people trust them? That's your, that's your wheelhouse. I, I think gradually people have to, uh, I, I, I give you the example of India. Minister, I just want to ask David Sin, because he's uh, from Fullerton Health, so he's dealing with these health issues, but how he sees that same issue, that important issue you've just raised. David? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we, we clearly are not experts, but what I can say is in, in helping to administer uh, almost all of the uh, publicly available vaccines uh, that the Singapore government has procured uh, for the Singapore population, population uh, our experience uh, at this point in time to date, I would echo what Minister has said, is, is, is at best um, anecdotal. Uh, from our perspective, uh, notwithstanding the fact that vaccines uh, or any vaccines to come out uh, have yet to be proven uh, to be 100% efficacy, uh, our, our view uh, with respect to that here uh, and also to, to Minister's point actually is if we look at uh, both from a public uh, health perspective, actually reopening up uh, border control or cross-border mobility for people uh, can actually be uh, pioneered uh, in some parts of the private sector. So in our work with uh, two institutions in Singapore, both the cruise industry, uh, but also the airline industry, namely Singapore Airlines, uh, what we started developing and we've seen um, requests from multinational corporations across Asia is how can you help our people travel safely yeah. across borders to facilitate <laughs> employment, labor and economic opportunities. So we are yeah. doing a lot of trial and pilots with, uh, with corporates actually, uh, where so to speak, um, what we consider as a, a, a safe uh, trial piloted versions of vaccine stroke uh, immunity passports specific for uh, a, a working demographic or a certain uh, population within a, a large employer group across the region. And that's fascinating because the information and the data that we're receiving in such pilots uh, can serve to be very, very helpful as governments, public health systems uh, look to implement cross-border mobility on a much larger scale. Yeah, and, and Robin, is the tech there? Do, uh, do we have the technical ability, technological ability to have passports, health passports? just need you to unmute. Uh, can you unmute? Yes, sorry, Keir. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that the tech is, 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 is there to do this job. I think there's a risk management issue that over the next three, six months, as, as Israel, the UK, other countries who get a larger percentage of vaccines into arms, we are going to learn from that data um, how much of a risk it is to allow somebody onto a plane, you know, who's got a vaccine, will they still be at risk of transmitting, even if they're protected uh, to a high degree to themselves? I think a lot of that data... Understood, but just in terms of the tech side, um, there are lots of different bits of tech. How close are we to integrating? Yeah, I, I think this is where the World Economic Forum and, uh, you know, the WHO and some other, you know, kind of leading global organizations probably need to, in the end, take quite a firm lead on, you know, we need to have those interoperable standards. There's a lot of things around W3C credentials and some of the other uh, kind of protocols which would allow a wider set of um, tech businesses to work with health organizations to ensure that the evidence that a vaccine's happened, what type of vaccine it is, some of the vaccines may be better efficacy than others, what type of test. It's very different for a lateral flow test in terms of my risk compared to a PCR test, but how many days old is it? There's a huge amount of that information, which if we can get the interoperable standards right over the next three, six months, and I, I you know, apologize, it's not more positive than that, but uh, I think over the next three, 
three, six months. Quite a lot of that technology could allow businesses to to be trustworthy, not just of their own staff. So a good example is, you know, Virgin Atlantic is doing testing using our app, using uh, a health organization using those products that gives them a very easy way for those virgin staff to prove to virgin that they have been tested that day and they can put it on their yoti or they can uh, receive that by email but as soon as you're trying to trust that somewhere else you know it's it's not really helpful to have a piece of paper or an email you know that's easily provable it's come from exactly sabrina two to uh, six months is that a light at the end of the tunnel for you well, I'll take anything. You know, we've been facing this crisis in March last year, so I've been living with it for a year. But I think for us, it's just we we want to know that there is a solution that is um, being looked at. And I absolutely agree with what Robin said that, you know, if WAF can take the lead and sort of like setting the standard and the protocol for that trust to be reestablished again between borders, that is the most important step that we need to take. Because with that, with the trusted technology, with the trusted medical solution, then everything will come. You know, the flights will come, the flights will come, our seafarers can get home. Yeah, okay. Uh, Sabrina Chow, Dr. Harsh, Vardan, Minister, Robin Toombs, David Sin, uh, it's been a great conversation. 